I am free at last. Uh, we, have, we are excited to be here. And we want to thank uh, Brother Valmi and the pastoral staff and you as a church for the invitation. And uh, we are just uh, really excited about not only the times that we're living in, but the God we serve. Amen? Amen. And so uh, when my PowerPoint gets up, we will uh, start. But it's very important that at the outset, uh, the title of our week is called The Great What? Yeah. Invitation. Parables of Salvation. If you are awake on planet Earth, whether you're an atheist or an Adventist, whether you're Buddhist or Baptist, you know that something is happening, that there is a transition, a shift on planet Earth, and it's not upward. It's a spiral out of control, amen? And so the human heart senses that something is about to happen. And we know what that something is. Amen? Amen? But there are literally millions, yea, billions of people who are part of the family of God, but they don't know it. They are his creation. They are the apple of his eye from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And so our ministry is called Ten Talents International. Ten Talents International, and our goal is to teach people to live a life that is pleasing in the sight of God. Amen. And so when you think of the number 10 in the Bible, there are four numbers in the Bible that represent uh, perfection or completion. Can anybody remember? Give, give me one of them. Seven, yes, seven, three, and 12, and 10. So three is a symbol of the Godhead, right? Seven is a symbol of spiritual perfection, right? And then you have 12, which is a symbol of governmental perfection, but 10 is the only number of completion that man has any part in. Anybody tell me something 10 in the Bible? The 10 commandments. Anybody else? 10 plagues, right? How many, how many fingers do you have? How many toes? 10. So 10 is God. He gives us the instructions, but we must cooperate. It's our responsibility. Therefore, the talents come in, right? And so talents is an acronym. And the first one Oh, we are a family ministry, by the way. Amen. Did you know that the church is made up of families? And there's a, there's a statement that says, so goes the home, so goes the church, so goes the community, so goes the, the nation. So if our nation is falling apart, or the nations of the world is falling apart, what does that mean about the home? You see, the nation only reflects what is going on in the home. Right? And the church reflects what's going on in the home. So if the church is dysfunctional, what does that say about our homes? Mercy. It's an indictment against us. You see, our vision, our desire is to equip and empower ordinary people to experience transformation through what? The love of God to be extraordinary servants, stewards, and leaders in the proclamation of the what? Everlasting gospel. And so T is, stands for truth. John 17, 3 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. All right? A stands for all. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in what? All. So the truth needs to go to all as what? As a witness. And then the end shall come. So if we want the end to come, we have to take the truth as a to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The next leaders. God needs leaders. Amen? 
And so search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way. Wait, where is the wickedness? And it says, and lead me in the way of everlasting. And where is God's way? Thy way, O Lord, is what? Jesus says, I am the, the truth and the so we cannot lead others until we have been led ourselves. Amen? Amen. All right. The next is earnestly. What's the next one? Amen. Earnestly. It says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should. We should what? Let them slip. What? Let what? Let what slip? You see, there's a, there's a situation where we can hear truth and we can hear it over and over and over again. We can be even leading it, but yet there's a, there's a danger of letting the truth slip. Is the truth slipped and fallen in the street, we're told? Yes. Men are trampling the truth. Is the truth something or is the truth someone? Someone. The next one is need. It says, but God shall supply what? Always. Now say it like you really have experienced that. God shall supply what? Always. All of your needs according to the riches of what? Always. Glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. So God is able to supply all of our needs. Amen. T stands for two. It says, but now being made free from sin, amen, amen. and become servants who? So as I work with God, as I cooperate with him, not only does he give me truth, not only does he make me a leader, not only does he equip me, but now he wants me to serve him. He says, you shall have your fruit unto what? So God wants us to serve us unto what? And the end of holiness is what? Everlasting life. And the S is for service. It says, for even the Son of Man did not come to what? To be served, but to serve and to give his life, what? A ransom. You see, when we serve God, he says, I want you to give your life as a ransom. And so this is 10 talents. And we have come as a family to you as our family, as our brothers and sisters, to extend an invitation of salvation. Amen. How many of you have friends and families who are not in a saving relationship with Jesus? You know someone on your job, at your school, the person that's a teller at the, the bank or the person that you go to, you go somewhere and you can see that they're not in a saving relationship with Jesus. And you are having a series of meetings about salvation. I met a young man yesterday. I was getting the car washed. We live on a dirt road, so white car, dirt road doesn't, doesn't go well. But he was doing the car, and I, I said, well, how old are you? He was like, oh, I'm 19 years old. And, and I was like, well, what do you think about religion? Are you a religious person? He said, nah, I'm, I'm more of a skeptic. And so we had this dialogue, and I said, hey, I'm doing a series of meetings at the, the, the SDA church here in Houston, and you should come. And he was like, man, and I'm like, serious, give me your number. He gave me his number. I, I sent him a text, and I'm praying. His name is Kyle. Will you pray for Kyle? Yes. You see, the invitation is just not from me. It, you are the invitation. Every person you come in contact with, you are his witnesses, saith the Lord. He says, you're my love letter written that every person you come in contact with should know about Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so, the Bible is the key to unlock truth. Did you know that? The Bible is the key to unlock truth. He says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Now, how many of you all know the truth? Okay, I, I, I thought I was in an Adventist church. Let me see. How many of you know the truth? If you're a Christian, regardless of your denomination or affiliation, you know the truth. But now the next question is, has the truth set you free? You see, it's one thing 
to come and study the Bible and have an intellectual understanding of what truth is. You know, in Sabbath school, right, we like to talk about the truth, amen? Or you like to have Bible studies about the truth. But notice the purpose of the truth. What's the purpose of the truth? To set you free. You see, there's three things we have to understand. Once we understand it intellectually, the Bible says that we have to know it to a point that I have freedom. Freedom from what, brothers and sisters? From sin. The Bible says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to me, to the Father, unto the Father, but by me. So Jesus is the truth. Do you know Jesus? Do you know him to the point that he is setting you free? Now, it's easy to say that publicly, but you know who knows whether I'm free or not? Because the Bible says, if the Son sets you free, you shall be what? Free. Who knows whether I'm free or not? Jesus. None of you know. Jesus. My family. Jesus. My family knows if I'm free or not. Why do I say that? Of course Jesus knows. But why would I say my family? Because they know me, and they're with me 24 hours a day. And they know whether daddy is free of irritation and, and aggravation. They know if I am, they, they know. So one thing is to grasp it. The next thing we have to do, it says that we have to embrace the truth. Have you embraced the truth? You see, many people know what truth is. But have they embraced the truth? You see, there was a woman, and she came to Jesus. You know, the woman with the alabaster box? And she came, and, and she was weeping, and she was crying, and she took this ointment, and she poured it on Jesus' feet, and everyone else said, what a waste. And it's interesting, Jesus says, he says in Luke 7, 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are what? And for she loved much. So he makes an equation that if you have much sin and you have been forgiven, you will, you will love much. What will you do? You will, love, you will be willing to give anything and everything for the one who has forgiven you. True or false? And so sometimes we, like them, we look at other people like, how much has God forgiven you? If you could tally up on a chart all the sins that you have ever committed, how much has your Savior forgiven you? And he says, now I need you to give to me. You see, it's one thing to know the truth and grasp it. The next thing is that we have to love the truth. And then step three is you have to surrender to the truth. See that? See, we like step one, amen? This is just the, the introduction, by the way. We like the step one, amen? Yes. And then step two is like, oh, man. But step three is where the rubber meets the road. Will you surrender to God? Will you surrender to the truth? Well, this week, by God's grace, we will be set free. Amen? Amen. 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 Notice, we, our, 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 this is a text I love. Let's go with me. Now, this is a Bible study. We're told that we need less sermonizing and more text by text searching of the word. But we need less what? Sermonizing. If you look up that word sermonizing, it means me telling you my opinion and trying to convince you that I'm right. So we need less of that, and we need more what? Text by text 
searching of the word of God. So you're going to be tempted this week not to bring your Bible. You're going to be tempted to bring your device or to just look at the scripture. And I'm going to tell you, you're robbing yourself if you do that. What we want to do is bring pen and paper and we want to take notes. Why? Because I want you to be able to turn around and lead somebody to Jesus this week. I don't want you to have to call the pastor, call the, hey, what was that text? I want, you to look, I want you to be able to know the truth and to a point that not only you are free, but guess what? You can set other people free. Amen. Job 36, 22. The Bible says, behold, God exalts by whose power? And the question God asks, who teaches like him? Who can teach you better than God? Can anybody? Can I teach you better than God? No. And so this week, we're not coming to hear a man. We're coming to hear the word of God. We're coming to hear the truth. And as we accept the truth, as we surrender to the truth, the truth will what? Set us free. Does anybody need to be set free from something? Yes. Well, before we open the word of God, let's go to our knees. And I want you to ask whatever might be binding you, whatever might be distracting you, whatever might be your burden. We're told not to bear any burdens on the Sabbath. Did you know that? So I want to give you an opportunity to pray for yourself and pray for me as we open the word of God. Those who are able, let's kneel. Father in heaven, Lord, I sense my great need. Lord, I am inadequate and unable to communicate that which you desperately want to communicate. So, Lord, I highly, I, I, I throw myself at your feet, Father, casting all my cares upon you because you care for me. Lord, let your word do that which only it can do. Do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look at Creation Week, and we're going to look at, we're laying a foundation for the rest of our studies together, and we're going to go th over some familiar territory. You can turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, and we're going to look at the Word of God. What are we going to look at? Now, we just had the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation, right? And one of the key tenets of the Reformation was sola scriptura, right? By the word of God and the word of God alone, right? Man should not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so we're going to look at the word. And as we look at the word, what is the purpose and function of the word of God in the life of the Christian? We're in Genesis chapter 1. If you have it, please say amen. amen. And what does Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God did what? Moved upon the face of the waters, and God said... Now, it's interesting that the, the Bible does not argue with the reader. Did you know that? It, it takes into consideration that the person who comes to the Bible knows that in the beginning there was a God. I love that about God. He doesn't, he doesn't, he just says what it is. It's true. So all the skeptics who's ever lived, the first verse of the Bible says, in the beginning, God. So everything after this sentence is about who? God, right? And so the Bible says in verse 3, and God said, what did God say? And God said, let there be, what happened? And there was light. And it's interesting 
God's word did something between light and darkness. What did it do? It divided what? So when I come to the word of God, I am in darkness. The Bible says I am like the earth. I'm formless and void. But when I come to Jesus, Jesus, who is the light of the world, he speaks. And what does he speak? And there's a separation between light and darkness. So when we come to the word of God, you should expect a separation between light and darkness in your life. Are you understanding? You see, God's word is powerful. And when it speaks, it, whatever it says, it has to happen. All right, day two. Let's go to verse six. Verse six says, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it. Wait, wait. So the first thing God's word did was separate what? Darkness from. And now God speaks again. And what does he do? It divides. So what is God's word doing? It's dividing. It's separating. Have anybody been divided lately? Has anybody been separated from anything or anyone in coming to Christ? A job, a spouse, or some things you love to eat, right? And so when God's word comes into your life, you should expect what? Separation. Interesting. It divided. You see, God's word divides. Notice it says that it divided what? What did it divide? The firmament in the midst of the waters... But and let the, the and let it divide the waters from the water. In prophecy, what does the waters represent? Uh oh. So when you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you're going to have some division where? In your relationships, right? And it's interesting. It says that word firmament means atmosphere. So when I begin to walk with Jesus, I should have a different atmosphere than those who don't walk with Jesus. True or false? True or false? But oftentimes, I have the same atmosphere as a worldling. I have the same atmosphere. I watch the same movies. I eat the same food. I dress the same. There's no difference between us and them. And then we say, I have an invitation for you. And they're saying, you look just like me. What are you inviting me to? You like what I like. Did you see the game? The Astros won. Who cares? Jesus is coming. Are you ready? You see, when God's word is allowed to come into the life, it has power. But we live in an impotent generation of Christians. We, claim, we know the truth. We might even love the truth. But we have not surrendered to the truth. And that's why we're not free. Because my Bible says, if the truth comes into your life, who is Jesus, he will set you free from sin. Amen. So... The heavens were divided. Day three. Day three, we're going to verse nine. Let's go down to verse nine. And God said, what did God say? Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together upon one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. So here, God says, let there be light. There's a division. God says, let there be a firmament. There's a division. Now he's going to divide the waters from the Land. So God's word, as we're seeing, what does God's word do? It divides, it divides. The Bible says in Hebrew, it's like a double-edged sword. And what does it do? It cuts. It divides. It separates. But if you're anything like me, there are things that I love that I don't want to get, be separated from. And so I struggle with the word of God. I struggle with the power of God and the promises of God. Interesting. So what happens when the word of God? He divided what? The waters and the land. Day four. Let's go to verse 14. If you have it, please say amen. amen. 
It says, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to what? Wait, so God's word. Are you seeing this pattern? That when God speaks, whatever he speaks, it automatically separates. And what is he dividing? The day from the night. The Bible says we are not children of the night. We are children of the, the day. Do the children of the night know that you walk in the light as he is in the light? And we have fellowship one with another. Jesus says you are the, the light of the world. Are you connected with the light source? Or are you an artificial light? Notice, the moon has no light in and of itself. It's just what? A reflection. Like I have no light, I can only reflect that which I have seen. Interesting. It says, let them be for what? Signs. signs. And for what? Seasons. seasons. And for what? Yeah. Days. And for years. Are there signs in the sun and the moon and the stars happening? Have we seen signs in the sun recently? Have we seen the waves roaring? Have we seen? You've experienced it, right? I just looked on it at the news, and I was like, wow, Houston's underwater. <laughs> Signs and seasons. Interesting. Day 5, verse 20. It says, and God said, let the waters bring forth. So when God's word goes forth, forth, what does it do? It divides, it divides, it divides, and then it begins to bring something forth. It begins to birth something. It begins to create something. It begins to do something in the life of the believer. Amen. It says, and God said, let the word waters bring forth abundantly. What? Wait, wait. So when God's word is born, what happens? It brings forth just minuscule. It brings forth just droplets. No, it says it brings forth abundantly. He says, I've come that you may have life and you may have it. Are you an abundant Christian. Amen. Do you know Solomon lived a life of abundance? David. And now you look at Christians today, we're poor, miserable, blind, we're naked, we're begging. Oh, please, would you please give to my ministry? Oh, please do something. I need the. Why? God says, if you are living by every word that proceeds out of my mouth, you will live a life of abundance. Amen. He says, the Gentiles will come to you. He says, arise, for your light has come. So where's the light in the church? Has the light gone out? That means the light has gone out in the home. But Jesus says, if you walk in the light, right? If you walk in the light, What's the light? Thy word is what? And a? But we come to church every Sabbath, Pastor. I pay my tithe. I'm vegan, vegetarian. I exercise. Man, I, I, I'm modest. I mean, I witness. Come on, I'm, I'm Sabbath school superintendent. I mean, I've been on mission trips. What more light? He says, many shall come to me in that day saying what? Lord, Lord, haven't we done what? We prophesied in thy name. And we did many good works in thy name. He says, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never even... And this is eternal life that they may what? Know him. Do you really know God? Do you really know God? You see, because to love him is to know him, and to know him is to what? Is to love him. So God's word does what? It divides. And what did it bring forth abundantly? These beautiful, beautiful, beautiful created things. Day six, verse 24. It says, if you have it, please say amen. amen. 
It says, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures. Are you a living Christian? Are you alive in Jesus Christ? Now, I know some of y'all had a hard week because I see eyes already going. If you, if you need to stand up, do some exercise. You know, we're told that the, the enemy brings in a death, a, 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 slu, a, slu, a stupor over the congregation when the word of God is going forth. If you are here in this place today, God wants to do a new thing in your life. This word has power to recreate you. And guess what? We worship on what day? Which is a memorial of? So every time I come to church, Pastor, every time I come, I should leave here recreated. But if if we're to be honest, that's not our Sabbath experience. You see, we're told that in order for one to keep the Sabbath holy, one must, can anybody finish it? Be holy. In order to keep the Sabbath holy, one must what? Be holy. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy what? Thy word is truth. Let's keep going. Look at the beautiful things that, day six. What did he do on day six? What did he do? I know that, but how did he make man? How did he make man? He got down and he got dirty and he could have spoke you into existence. But he said, no, 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 no. I have to get intimate with the clay. I have to mold and shape because I am the potter. They are the clay. And he says he, he molded them and shaped them. Can you imagine? He's like, oh, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give London this. And I'm going to give London that. And, man, I'm going to give this person. And he's, he's thinking of all the gifts and the abilities that he is equipping humanity with to rightly represent him in the universe because there's a schism or there was an attempted reformation in heaven. Did you know that? Yes. We're told in Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 12, you know it well, and there was what? War, War where? In heaven. in heaven. Can you imagine that? Perfect harmony, perfect happiness, and war broke out. It says Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels and this whole great controversy is over the character of God. And we're coming down to the closing seconds of the final battle. And God's word is what the battle's over. I, I, I want that to sink in. You see, the devil brought an argument, a polemic. He was the first politician. And he began to try to win the hearts of God's created beings away from the allegiance of God. You see, the devil cannot create. He has no creative power. He can only take that which God has and perverts it. We're going to study what happened when the angels followed, and thus humanity. But notice, originally, God created you in his own image. Amen. And he created them what? Male and? Is that under attack? Oh, you better believe it. Even in God's remnant church, it's under attack. But the Bible says, let God be true, and every man be a? A liar, right? What God sets forth, it is forever. He changes not. He says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. 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 Are you following me? So he created you in his image. Psalm 33, verse 6 and 9 says, it says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, 
and all the host of them by the what? So God speaks life into you. And what happens? Oh, man, do you have the breath of life? Or are you just a spiritual zombie? We, you, you know that attacks our belief of the biblical belief of the state of the dead, right? We don't believe in zombies, do we? Are you sure? Because as we travel, I go to places, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and I go to people outside in the streets, in the highways and byways, and they're more excited about the word of God than the people of God. <laughs> they'll talk with me, they'll argue with me, and, and then I come to the people of God, the people of the book, the power is here, and they're like looking at their watch. Oh man, I got my rump, I got my pot, I got, man, is he still going? <laughs> have you just come to hear a man tickle your ears? Or have you come to hear the God of the universe speak life into your existence? There's a big difference, I'm telling you. There's a big difference just coming to church and going home and say, check, I did it. And there's a big difference in coming and saying, man, today we saw Jesus. He walked up and down the aisles. He touched me. It says, for he spake and it was done. He commanded and what? It stood fast. So what's the point? God's word is what? Creative. Creative. Amen. So how do we study the Bible? After, oftentimes, I realize people do not know how to study the Bible. That's why these Bible training schools are popping up all over the world. Christians used to be, especially Protestants, sola scriptura, right? We used to know the Bible but now we know LeBron stats or Harden or we know everything else. We know what's going on in politics. We know what Trump did and, uh, you know, we know everything else, but we don't know the thing that will give us life. And we wonder why we're spiritually dead. Amen. Notice I say we. I, I, I'm only the messenger, right? I'm, I'm right here with you. Amen? Amen. So notice. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are what? Revealed, Revealed belong unto us and to our? So notice, when God gives you a secret, he gives it not only for you, but for your posterity. Amen? Amen. And so our responsibility is to give it up, give it to our children to the third and to the fourth generation, but now we have generations that don't know the Word of God. It's boring. There's no power in it. I tried it. He says, the secret of the Lord is with who? With God. And He reveals it to us and our children that we may do what? Wait, wait. So when we get the word and he tells us a secret, he expects us to preach and tell other people to do it. Right? No, he says you have to do it. Notice what it says in Deuteronomy 30 verse 2. It says that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest what? Obey his and that thou mayest cleave where? So who am I supposed to cleave to? The Lord, how am I supposed to cleave to him? By his voice. Where do I hear his voice? In his word. Have you gone through series of, of drought in your Bible study? I'm going to be, I have. I've gone, and I, I'm studying, I'm studying, I'm even preaching. I'm like, Lord, what happened? <laughs> the word used to be alive. And now I'm just reading it out of routine. Deuteronomy 32, verse 1, it says, if you have it, please say amen. amen. I know I'm going fast. We're trying to lay a foundation, amen. It says in verse 1, well, let me turn there. 
Deuteronomy 32, verse 1, my keynote is not working. Deuteronomy 32, verse 1. If you have it, please say amen. amen. Mr. Soundman. Mr. Technician. All right. Deuteronomy 32, starting with verse 1. It says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth, Verse 2, my doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and upon the showers upon the grain, because I will what? So notice, God says his word is going to drop like? Have we been waiting for rain to drop? Are you following me? We're not talking about precipitation outside. We're talking about inside the church. Have we been waiting for rain to drop? Why has it not dropped? He says it will fall like doctrine. What will it fall like? Doctrine. You know, there's an attempt to change the word of God. There's an attack against the word of God. There's an attack against the seventh day Sabbath, there's an attack against marriage, there's an attack against God's order of leadership, there's an attack against the word, and God says that when his word is allowed to do what it will do, guess what will happen? Rain will fall. Amen. At the word of God, Elijah said it will not rain. For how long? Three and a half years, it will not rain. Was there a time period that represents three and a half years? <laughs> In prophecy, that there was no rain, there was no light, there was no truth? Anybody tell me, what was that time period called? The dark ages. Why was it dark? Because there was no light, <laughs> right? And then something happened prophetically that there was a burst of light on this planet that it was called the what? The second great awakening, right? But before that, you had the Reformation. And the Reformation said, no, we're not going to follow the traditions of men. We're going to follow sola scriptura. And there was a great war, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the... Are you the remnant? Oh, we, I want you to think about that. I want you to think about that. Are you the remnant? How do you know? How do you know you're the remnant? Because you're in the, the right church, keeping the right day, have the right diet? What makes you the remnant? It says they keep and have the what? Do you have a testimony for Jesus? Are you a testimony for Jesus? You see, these are things that God has been dealing with my heart. He's been dealing with me, and he's been revealing to me that I am of most men miserable. And I need a new heart. I need Jesus. I need God's word to come alive in my life. Amen. I need the bread of life. Amen. You see, for far too long, I've had an intellectual understanding of the truth. But we're coming to the time in Earth's history that we have to settle in to the truth. We're going to skip some things because we got to get to Jesus. Amen? I want to read this one. Let's go to Deuteronomy 33.3. Deuteronomy 33.3, this is how to study the Bible. We're, we're laying a foundation for this week because I hope that the purpose of this week is to, to bring you to Jesus. It's for you to be a part of that abundant harvest that is going to happen. Amen? It says in Deuteronomy 3.33 verse 3, it says, do you have it? Please say Amen. It says, yea, he loved the people 
all his saints are in their hand, and they sat at thy feet, every one shall what? So the title of our study is Receiving the Word. So notice, God goes to Mount Sinai, Jesus, and he's there, and they just came out of bondage. They just came out of slavery. They just came out of Egypt, the world, and he brings them to Mount Sinai, and what do they do first? It's in your Bible. Devotion. They sat at Jesus' feet. Did you have your devotion this morning? You see, I find that oftentimes people come to church, they come to study the Bible, and they have no real connection with God, and they say, man, that, was a, that, that, that sermon was weak, man. <laughs> I mean, he made some good points, but there was no power in it. Was the power with the preacher? No, no where's the power? In the Word of God. So every time I study the Word of God, regardless who is the vessel, I should leave that experience what? I should leave that experience what? Restored. Recreated. Refreshed. Is it hot in here or is it just me? All right, it's a little... So let's go. Now, Jesus is what? He's Emmanuel what? God with us. So now, in the Old Testament, we see that the word of God is powerful. It divides, it recreates, it establishes, it enlightens, it molds, and it shapes God's people. And so now Jesus comes, and we're told in John 1, 14, what does John 1, 14 say? <laughs> Come on, y'all know this. Okay, John 1.1. 1, 1. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was? Verse 14. Don't look. Don't cheat. No, you can look. Go ahead. And the Word became? Well, wait. So there comes a point in your Christian experience that the word must become flesh. Amen. I want you to think about that. There's a time in Jesus' experience that he had to put the scrolls down. Follow me. He had to put the scrolls down. He had studied enough. He had memorized the word. But he said, now the word must become flesh. You see, that's what the world is waiting for, my brothers and my sisters. That, that loud cry that goes to every, it says, it's as a witness. And the world is going to recognize the word has become flesh. That's what was the power of the early church. They said, man, they're Jews and they're Greeks and they're Scythians. And they're, they're from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, every rank of society, every language, and they just love each other. Man, I mean, I've never seen black folks and white folks and Asian, I've never seen so much love. That's powerful, brothers and sisters. That's powerful. You see, man cannot produce that. That is divine. And we have black churches and white churches and Asian churches and, and every, and when are we going to be like Jesus? He says, I pray that they may be. He says, this is the evidence. This is the witness. If you want to be my disciples, they will know you're my, love, you're my disciples by your 28 fundamental beliefs. Right? When I get my doctorate, when I get my PhD in theology and philosophy, then they will know. Why are young people going out the back door by the droves? Because they say there's no power in it. There's no power. I mean, I'm tired of listening. I've been listening my whole life. 
Where's the power? They go home, mom and dad arguing, fussing, fighting. They go to the Christian school, the teachers arguing, fussing, and fighting. They come to church, board can't get together. And then you wonder, what? What? I sent them to Christian school. I mean, we had devotion every. It has to become flesh. He says, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Amen. You see, Jesus was the Word made what? It says, in seeing the multitudes, he went up on into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples, who came to him? Wait, who came to Jesus? his disciples. You see, there was a mixed multitude. There were some people that just came because they heard that maybe Elijah was back on the scene, or, or maybe it was, man, John the Baptist, or maybe someone else. They said, let's go see. They were looky-loos. You know, we have looky-loos in the church. Oh, man, I heard that they have a, a, a hired gun coming in over there at, uh, at Houston International Church. I should go over there and see what's going on. And then you had disciples. What's a disciple? One who is under the discipline, the training, the tutelage of the master. Are you a disciple? How do you know? How do you know? How do other people know you're a disciple? What's the, what's the one defining characteristic of true disciples? They shall know you are my disciples by your... Oh, man. Not law. Love. But love is love, law, the law at work. I want, you to, I want you to follow that. The law is love at work. Right? It's the working of God in your heart. And so the people come to him, and what did he do? They sat down. He opened up his mouth. And when Jesus speaks, he says what? Blessed are the... He says, blessed are the? What's the result of being poor in spirit? Okay, Matthew chapter 5, go there. <laughs> Theirs is what? Theirs is the kingdom of God, okay. Blessed are the? Oh, come on. See, see why you have to bring your Bible? You can't trust me. <laughs> you got to open your word. You're robbing yourself if you come to church without the word of God. Now you have to depend upon a man. The Bible says, curse is a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his what? There are going to be many people that have gone to church their whole life, and they will be lost. They're going to be like Eutychus. Anybody know who Eutychus was? He was in the church. Who was preaching? Paul was preaching up a storm. He had a long-winded sermon. <clears throat> he had a long-winded sermon. And his brother was preaching, and, and Eutychus was like, <sighs> and his brother was in the church, and he fell out the church. He died, and praise God is a God of mercy, amen? Paul didn't go down there like, man, what you doing sleeping, man? He was like, come on, man, get up. I'm gonna get, hey, you think Eutychus went to sleep in church again? Not in your life. <laughs> Eutychus was there front row. He was front row like this. Every week. It's true. It's true. Psalm says, show me thy ways, O Lord, and teach me thy, lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my, on thee do I wait, what? All day long. He says, good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach all right, are we having any sinners in the house? Yes. Come on, raise your hand. It's okay. <laughs> he says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus came to save sinners. Yes. Are there any sinners in the house? Yes. Then you are a candidate for salvation. Praise yes. God. Amen. Yes. The, the gospel's good news, my brothers and my sisters. He says, the meek will he what? Yes. In judgment. And the meek he will what? You see, God is the great teacher of the universe. And nature is a book that is a transcript of his character. 
But God made the word flesh in Jesus. And he says, I will guide you. I will lead you. You are the apple of my eye. So should I have to call anyone pastor? What do you think? What should I do? You know what I say? I take him to Job 36, 22. What does Job 36, 22 say? God will be exalted by his power. Who teaches like him? And they say, well, what do you want me to do with that, pastor? Go to the Lord. <laughs> he knows what's best for you. I know nothing. What man is it that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he chooses. What's the point? If you want to really have a really good devotion, a good experience, you have to sit at the feet of Jesus. Amen. And it's not, it, it takes time, my brothers and my sisters. It takes time. But we don't have time anymore. We have time for everything else except for the one thing that will transform our characters. I'm telling you by experience. So notice, let's go to Luke. We'll look at a couple more scriptures and we're done. Is that okay? Yes. All right, you following me? Yes. Are you awake? Yes. All right. We're in Luke chapter 10. When you have it, please say amen. amen. If you need a little bit more time, as one of my fellow preachers says, say, have mercy. Amen. All right, where are we at? Luke chapter 10, verse 38. I still hear some pages turning. It says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha. What does she do? All right. So Jesus comes to town, he goes to Martha's house, and what does she do? She received him. Now what does 1 John 1.12 say? As many as what? Received them, he gave power to become what? So Martha was a child of God. Are you a child of God? So she received him. What does she do? She received him into her house, verse 39, and she had a sister called Mary, which also, what? Sat at Jesus' feet and what? Oh, there's a, there, there's, there's a separation here. You see it? There are two types of people. There's one, like Martha, who received Jesus into her house. He says, behold, I stand at the door and what? I'm knocking. And she said, come on in, Lord. And then she got to work. She, she was the head deacon. I'm not deacon. Head deaconess. She was the head elder. She was the cook. She did everything in the house. But Mary, she did the most important thing. She sat at Jesus' feet and she, she was living by the word. You see, there's a difference in just being in the house of God. There's a difference in just coming to church. Are you sitting at Jesus' feet? Now, what did Martha do? She got upset. She was furious with her sister. And she was like, Lord, tell that girl to get up. You see me around here? I mean, she didn't say it like that, Jesus. She was more diplomat. Jesus, would you please tell my sister to get up and help me? But he could read her spirit. He could feel the agitation. You know when people are upset, and you can feel it, right? They have an atmosphere, right? And so she comes in, and he's like, Martha, Martha, you are burdened with many things. But Mary has, wait, could Martha have chosen the same thing? Wait, wait. Could Martha have sat at Jesus' feet? Why did she not? She was what? She, she was trying to show off to Jesus? Okay, that might be true. We have that in the church too, right? She was doing good things, but she wasn't doing the most important thing. Some of us are doing good things for Jesus. 
But we're not doing the most important thing. Sitting at Jesus' feet. There she is. <laughs> there she is. Sitting at Jesus' feet. Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. And what? And heard his words. So this week, go to Luke chapter 8. This week, we are not coming to hear a man. We are coming to sit at the feet of Jesus. Now some of you are going to be extra special busy this week. All hell's going to break loose in your house. Your job is going to call you and say, hey, you have to do this, and, and your car is going to break down. My computer crashed last week. All my presentations, I'm like, oh, Lord. No. And I was like, well, this is par for the course. I should expect, right? I mean, the devil is, I mean, if I could just tell you, but guess what? Because the devil trembles. He trembles at the sound of fervent prayer. Amen. He trembles at the, that you would ever see Jesus. He trembles that the word would ever become flesh again on planet earth. He's like, just sing the songs, please. Just, just, just be consistent in your diet. It's okay, but don't let Jesus come in. Don't let that word become flesh. Because when that happens, he knows, and then the end shall come. I mean, you know the signs. The handwriting's on the wall, my brothers and sisters. Everyone in the world knows. But there's only one who could interpret. Why could Daniel interpret? Why could Daniel interpret? What did he do? Did he know Nebuchadnezzar's dream? He had no clue. But he said, hey, let's have a prayer meeting. Wait, he called a what? If I was to ask, what's prayer meet meetings uh, 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 attendance like? I won't ask that question. But if I were to ask that, that is the barometer. The barometer. And I'm guilty as charged. But that's the barometer of the church. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and wait, wait, what, what's the rest, the rest of it? Then I will uh oh you missed it. Let's go there. First Chronicles what does it say? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, wait, wait, then I will what? And I will heal their land. Do you need healing? Oh, does our, does our land need healing? Absolutely. Does our church need healing? Do our families need healing? Jesus was the great medical missionary. We're in Luke chapter what? Eight. Verse 35, if you have it, please say amen. amen. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils was departed, sitting at the what? Feet of Jesus. And he was what? Clothed and in his... And they were afraid. Wait, wait. I love this. So this man was possessed of demons, plural, and nobody had a problem when he was possessed. They were like, oh yeah, that's Uncle Jamal, or that was, you know, Crazy Timmy, or whatever, you know. And G Jesus comes to town, this man gets delivered from demons, and the whole village is afraid. Why? Why? Arise and shine. What? Thy light has come, 
And he says, the glory of the Lord is what? Risen upon you. And what is God's word? When light comes into your life, he said, let there be light. And there's a separation. He was no longer a worldling. He was a Christian. And they recognized that the five minutes he spent with Jesus changed everything. And he could no longer. They were happy when he was on drugs. They were happy when he was strung out and intermarried. I mean, all of that. They were happy when they were going to the club and whatever it is, the sin that you, they were happy when the marriage was broken up. When they were an F student, they were happy. They had no problem. And then healing came in. And now they start, oh, you think you're better than people. You, you think you're better than me now, right? <laughs> Has anybody lost friends, family members because of your walk with God? It's painful, isn't it? He says, but if you love mother, father, sister, brother, job, car, house, career, more than me, he says, what? You're not worthy. Why would a God of love say that? He said, I left everything in heaven for you. I left the adoration of angels. I left everything. I gave up part of my divinity and I accepted humanity. And it will be mine for eternity. And we argue over food? I'm like, really? Talking to myself. I mean, sports? Like, really? Oh, it's so hard, Lord. He's like, you have not resisted unto blood. Come on, Wesley. Look at the, they resisted unto blood. Where is the Reformation? I think, I think, I think that people are saying the Reformation is dead because the church is dead. You see, the children of darkness have become wiser than the children of light in their generation. If there was life, they would not say it was dead. But because there's no power in the church, they can say, oh, man, the Reformation is over. And you got people saying, no, the Reformation, they're saying, where's the power? Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, chapter 1, verse 5. We're coming to an end. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. You see, Jesus, <laughs> everywhere he went, there was a Reformation. Or a revival or a revolt. Are you, am, am I right? Everywhere he went, he said, the enemies will be those of your own household. Notice. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Paul is speaking here. He went to this place called Thessalonica. And you know what he did? He preached. What did he preach? He preached the gospel... And what did the gospel have with it? Power. So the gospel is the power of God unto? And what else did he have with him? The Holy Ghost. What else did he have? What did the people receive as a result of the gospel? Assurance. And then he says, and you know what type of man I was. He lived the life. My brothers and my sisters, in order to receive the word, you have to be a Berean. Remember the Bereans? It says, they receive the word with all what? Readiness of mind, and they search the scriptures what? Daily to see whether those things were so. So how many of you want to accept God's invitation of salvation? Now, you know you're going to be tested on that. From the time we leave this sanctuary, the war is on. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? Don't let anything or anyone deter you from receiving the blessing. Don't let anyone or anything keep you from coming to the feet of Jesus. Before you come tonight, spend some time at the feet of Jesus. Don't come empty-handed. Spend time with Jesus. Do we have a special uh, closing here?
Okay, we'll have closing hymn. Our closing hymn. What is it? What's the closing hymn? 